Greetings, my friends, and welcome to the Vero Senior Hard. On this program, I want to take you back to primitive Methodism, when they used to ride a horse between little towns in America, and the rider being a preacher of the gospel, coming to tell the story of the Messiah to those who are on the trails out west. There were no preachers then, I'm afraid. Not enough to go around, and the preachers that there were were given about five dollars a year to go out and preach on the circuit. Sometimes it would be a year before they would come around to your house or little church again. But there is a great heritage for all of us in the institution of circuit riding preachers. There's nobody that is listening now that hasn't been affected by a circuit riding preacher sometime way back in the primitive days of the American frontier. And in this program, I am taking out of the archive a special interview with Reverend Walter Roberts. A Welshman came over from Wales to ride the circuit, spread the good news. From town to town and from house to house, Walter Roberts is the oldest circuit riding preacher still alive. In fact, he is the only one alive according to current record on Wrigley's Believe It or Not. Our reckoning is Walter is uh, somewhere around 256 years old right now. Fortunately, when he was on the trail, he discovered the Vilcabamba mineral assets that Ponce de Leon was looking for so diligently. Since this interview, I'm afraid to say that our dear pastor and friend has passed on to be with the Savior whom he loved and worked diligently for his whole life. This interview also features my friend, Jackson Smither, who likes to think he runs this program. So we have the old, old circuit rider and the young circuit rider. Jackson having ridden the circuit in Georgia for a few years, several churches, lots of undercooked pork, including chitlins, whatever the light is. Uh, I want to talk about pioneering times now, and I have invited one of the great circuit riding preachers to be with us on this tape and let him tell you a little bit about circuit riding days. I want to thank uh, Walter Johnson for being here, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to him. He's got a great story to tell. Listen up now. Walter, Reverend Johnson, over here, over here. <laughs> This thing, this thing on? Go ahead, Walter, you're on. Why, it warms this old circuit ride and Methodist heart that you've invited me to share my thoughts with you after so many, many years, Jackson. It's been almost 200 years since I last traveled this way. I recall the warm hospitality and warmth of a cabin fire as I sat with the pioneer family and prayed and sang for hours well past midnight. Pray, bear with this old time traveler a bit as I think back. We've become almost legendary figures. You see, the impersonation of religious romance and ministerial chivalry, you see, the the, the very symbol of the great Methodist denomination of the 20th century. But, but what of the 18th century? Why, we brought news of the brethren and churches, if any, within our far-reaching circuits. Of time, the only books seen by the early pioneers were those brought in the circuit riders' saddlebags. We also brought a kind of harmless humor to the people. For our acquaintance with the world and contact with all classes and manner of men gave us quite an aptness for repartee, as you might suspect. In fact, we have been pronounced as the best humorists of our country's revolutionary period. And while this romantic picture painted by poets, historians, and novelists, and even artists was true in some situations, for the most part, the life of a circuit-riding preacher was one of constant hardships. It followed as merciless a calling as ever challenged brave men. Long rides through the rain, sleet and snow, nights in the open, the risks of sickness and deprivation, 
across the mountains infested with savages at imminent risk of our lives. These and more were all part of a day's work. You see, our saddle was our desk and our office the sky. We ministered in a harsh and unforgiving world where whites and Indians both were as wild as the woods they inhabited. But man stressed, you know, his God's opportunity. And we were privileged to be counted as one among such godly men. Francis Asbury began his itinerant ministry the day after his arrival in Philadelphia. Before his death, he had ridden over 247,000 miles on horseback and delivered over 17,000 sermons, mostly in rural America, we figure. Uh, he once wrote in his journal about what he described as an awful journey. He related how, on an April venture through the mountains of North Carolina, accompanied by the most awful thunder and lightning, along with heavy rain, he and his companion crept for shelter into a dirty little house where the filth might have been taken from the floor with a spade. He also wrote how they felt the want of fire but could not get even a little wood to make it, and what they gathered was wet. On another journey in mid-July, he wrote of having to lay along the floor a few deer skins with the fleas. <laughs> of this he remarked, Oh, how glad should I have a plain, clean plank to lie on! as preferable to the most of these beds. And when the beds are in a bad state, why the floors are even worse. Often it became necessary for us to physically resist the rowdy element present at most frontier meetings. Methodist preacher Peter Cartwright was at a camp meeting in Ohio where the attendance consisted partly of a rabble of rowdies, drunk and armed with clubs, knives, and horse whip, while in the middle of his sermon on a Sunday night, Two of these rowdies tried to break up the service. The magistrate present refused to preserve the order, so Cartwright challenged the two and their many confederates a fist fight that made into a brawl ensued. Finally, Peter Cartwright bested one of the leaders, and the troublemakers were arrested and fined. Wait a minute, Walter. You mean to say that they actually got in a fist fight? Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about Peter Cartwright. He was one of the best fighting preachers that we knew. Yeah, you know, many of us were shot, Tommy Hawk. Many more had to sometimes resort to violence as Peter Cartwright did. But as Francis Asbury often reflected, we must take the people as we find them and make them better. Well, to be right honest with you, Walter, there's some people that I've taken find in, in some parishes I've had that I wouldn't mind a bust in a few times. What do you think of that? Ah! <laughs> well, Jackson, I always thought you were something of a colorful character, but I've never seen you down there now, brawling in the name of the church or punching somebody in the side of the head just because I didn't agree with you. <laughs> That'd be pretty colorful. I just don't see you doing it. Well, I'm afraid I wouldn't do it, really. I'd be scared to do that. And you that are listening to this tape, you know I've never punched anybody in the church. Not yet, I'll bet you. <laughs> but you might. You never know. Speaking of colorful colleagues, I want to tell you a little about Lorenzo Dow. Uh, he was the first Methodist to preach in what's now called Alabama, delivering a milestone sermon at the old Tensaw in Baldwin County in the spring of 1803. Now, he is called crazy by many of his contemporaries. His eccentric appearance and manners made a startling impression whenever he went, and he was often met with jeers and sneers. Now, down there at old St. Stephen's, Dow preached to the inhabitants in saloons and dance halls and 
anywhere else that there was gathered. Now, the town people didn't take to him or his meetings and they ordered him out of town. Lorenzo left, but only after praying to the Almighty to send a curse upon the place and predicting that the town would become the roosting place for the bats and the owls, and that people would pass it on by. Now, that's proven true, you know. Old St. Stephen's now is virtually abandoned. Yeah, Walter, I've been down there to Old St. Stephen's, and you're right, there's hardly anything left there but a street sign. I just wondered, you probably got paid a lot of money to do this circuit riding stuff because it entailed so much danger and hardship and so much expenses. What kind of pay were you getting to do that? Why, Jackson, you're not supposed to ask anybody what they get paid. But what did they pay you down there at that church, I wonder? I bet it's more than they paid me to ride on the circuit. Because the pay isn't much of an incentive. Just think about the Reverend E.B. D. Johnson that served the Mount Pleasant Methodist Protestant circuit around 1880. He was one of my kinfolk. He traveled about 1,700 miles, and he received about $85 for his services. <laughs> and then there was Reverend H.C. Stilwell that moved from Alabama to Texas in 1854, where he and his family lived in a log cabin with dirt floors. He didn't have no paucity. His salary was set at about $225 in 1809, but he received only $46 of that $225 he was promised. <laughs> so, hey, why didn't we do it? <laughs> we did it because we wanted to bring the good news from the heart of God to his children all over the pioneer areas. Now, how could we stand the rigors of circuit riding in those days, you might wonder? Even if we did have that kind of fervent desire in our heart. Well, the plain and simple truth is, we didn't stand it. We, we died under it. No group of men ever lived up more fully to the truth. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You know, some of my early contemporaries died before their careers had much more than just begun. Of those 650 preachers who joined our Methodist itinerancy by the opening of the 19th century, about 500 had to locate. That's a term used when those too worn out, they're just too worn out to travel anymore. 500 of the 650, they just were done give out. They done give all they had. Others had to take periods for recuperation. Of the first 737 members of the various conferences to die up until the year of 1847, 203 of these were between 25 and 35 years of age, and 121 between the years of 35 years and 45 years. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to tell you that nearly half the circuit riding preachers like me, they died before they was even 30 years old. Two-thirds died before they could render even 12 years of service, and almost one-third within the first five years. But despite it all, worship and praise God we did. The tiny hymn books we had in our saddlebags had no music, they only had words. We sang these words to any familiar tunes that people knew. Oftentimes these were barroom tunes, you know. Some of these songs they learned in the barroom while they was drinking. But we put God's words to the devil's music, and that's how we won them over. Walter, would you believe that I still have one of those old hymn books with just the words in it from revival times from the 19th century? I bet you'd like to see that, wouldn't you? I've seen enough of them books. I never want to see another one of them. But maybe if I feel like it when I get done here, maybe I'll be able to sing you a little song that we used to sing out on the circuit in those old days. But before I do that, I want you to remember that John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he never intended to establish a church separate from the Church of England. 
And it wasn't at all happy about the outcome of the American Revolution either. You know, he was on the other guy's side. He was there with King George and all. And we were kind of fighting against them. However, he was a practical man. And he sent Thomas Coke over to America with the authority to ordain Francis Asbury. The only Methodist preacher to stay in the colonies throughout the revolution. So we had us a, a bishop then, Francis Asbury, here in, in the colonies, while they was fighting the war for the, for the independence of these United States. You know, John Wesley, he said, give me a hundred preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen, such alone, we're going to shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven right here on the earth. Well, sir, over 200 years ago, about 60 of us gathered together on Christmas Eve of the year 1784 in a small meeting house on Lovely Lane, just a few blocks from the harbor there in old Baltimore. Now, it was a strange and very solemn assembly indeed. Although most of us was from the backwoods like me, we were dressed in knee breeches and we carried hats with broad rims and low crowns and though our clothes were as black as dirges, they cast a spell of gloom over the room. It was somewhat relieved by the youth of our faces. Because we was young, and we were so full of life, and so full of the fire of God. All of the 60 or so itinerants who came in response to Reverend Freeborn Garrison's call, almost all was in their 20s. Even our leaders, Dr. Thomas Coke, was only 37, and the soon-to-be Bishop Francis Asbury was only 39. Now, now, oh, Asbury, yeah. That, too, was something that Wesley never intended, that Asbury be made a bishop. And he really didn't have no authority to make him a bishop anyway. But, indeed, he was made a bishop. Now, that Asbury, at that meeting in Baltimore, was ordained a deacon on one day. He was ordained an elder the next day. And at the insistence of all of us present, he was consecrated a bishop on the Third day, December 27th, I'm telling you, 1884. No, that's 1784. Now that's what I recall. That's what happens <laughs> when you get to be 300 years old like me. You kind of get your dates mixed up. But anyway, that Asbury, he was a, a deacon one day, an elder the next, and then he became the bishop. Thus, the Methodist Church began. The first Christian denomination to be organized in America. Did you know that, Jackson? Well, I wasn't sure of that. I thought maybe the Episcopal Church was first. No, no, no. That was the Church of England that was sent over here. The, the Methodist Church was the first one in America. Go look up in your history book. It was no accident that America and Methodism grew up together because of us. The horse-riding, circuit-riding preachers, the early church was able to keep pace with the young country's westward expansion. Of times, the first person of a pioneer and family in common, even as they're unloading their wagon, yeah, there was a Methodist circuit-riding preacher right there to greet them and help them get their stuff in the house, sometimes help them build the house. It was often said that, in the wilderness, the only thing stirring, even in the worst weather, were the crows and those Methodist preachers. Now, what do you think about that? <laughs> I'm really getting tired now, Jackson. I got to take my leave, but I'm going to leave you with this. Christ died to save us from our sins. With Christ in our heart and soul, I implore you, as Wesley did, make the world your parents, Jackson. And you too, if you're hearing this tape, you make the world your parish, just like he told us to. Go forth and indeed shake them gates of hell 
and set up the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And may God be with you. God be with you. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. That was a wonderful testimony. I can see that you're really out of breath. And may Yahweh be with you all. Uh, Walter, are you sure you can't just get a little breath together to sing that song that you were telling us that you might do at the end, huh? Wouldn't you just come back and sing? Let me sing. Let's hear this thing. Well, Jackson, I got, I got to fix my teeth first. <laughs> there we go. Now just hold on. Let me go get my old guitar and see if I can't sing a little bit of that song. Come on, come on, Walder. You can't get out of it that easy. You already told me that the goat done ate your guitar about 150 years ago. Go ahead and try the song, would you? Do it for me. Well, the circuit riding preacher used to ride across the land with the rifle in his saddle and the Bible in his hand. He told the prairie people all about the promised land as he went riding, singing down the trail. Leaning, leaning, so safe and secure from all our lives. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Uh, Jackson, Jackson, wait a minute now. You see, they're going to think that you and me is the same person if you don't sing along with me on this next verse, you know. So come on now, sing along. The second riding preacher traveled through the mire and mud, told about the fiery furnace and the Noah and the flood. He preached the way to heaven was by water and the blood. As he went riding, singing down the trail, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Where is power? Wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. How's that? Jackson, Jackson, I just can't take any more oh, come of this. I'm an old man. Oh, keep going. I'm just about to give up. You're doing just Will fine. Will you take it from here and maybe sing this next verse or two? Then maybe I'll try to chime in on the last one. Oh, boy. Well, I guess I could go ahead and do a couple of verses, but you have to come in on the last. The circuit riding preacher slept in flea infested barns. Even then he felt the comfort of the everlasting arms that gave him strength to travel on to churches, homes, and farms. As he went riding, singing down the trail, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, yes, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Hey, I'm really enjoying this now. The circuit riding preacher preached from off the stones of graves in the open, in smoky rooms, in bat infested caves. And though the places changed, the word was always Jesus saves. When he went riding, singing down the trail. Okay, you've had enough time to get your breath. Come in now on this last verse. We're almost out of tape. There's a meeting mm. up. In heaven with the circuit riders there All rejoicing in their missions They fulfilled most everywhere And they're looking out for all the living circuit riders here As they go riding, singing down the trail Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah, as they go riding on. Yes, I'm, I'm talking about them circuit ride yeah, man. preachers. Yeah, now, man. God bless you all. Hallelujah. I'll talk to you the next time yes, I get sir. a chance if I'm still living there. Thank Bye you, Walter. now. God bless, bless you, you. You too, sir. I just can't imagine why anybody thinks that Walter and I are the same person. Bye now, Walter. See you later. Hey! Hey, look out for that tree!